Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Min, and I'm your host for today from India's Property Australia. And you're listening to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. Today, we have a guest, special guest speaker, Ryan Quaid from QSpec. Ryan, welcome. Oh, good morning, Min, and uh, thanks for having me on the SDA Housing Podcast. Thanks, mate. This is our second second round. Last time we did this podcast, uh, it was uh, wasn't recorded properly, so we're going to do it again this time. So, hopefully, we all go well today. <laughs> yeah, mate, and um, practice makes perfect. So, you know, I'm sure this one will be even better. Mate, um, can you explain who QSpec is and what you guys do? Sure thing. So, uh, QSpec Building Mobility Solutions. We're a mobility specific um, building company that specializes in creating uh, function and independence for our clients. Um, so if you're looking for a solution uh, to age in place or uh, if you've got a disability and you've got some barriers within your home, um, we, we can come out, uh, we can assess your current environment and we'll make adjustments to create that function and, and independence that you desire. Wonderful. So whereabouts are you guys based and how big is your team? So we're based on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, we service all the way from and, and, as, and, and our, our listeners are all Australia wise. They don't know where Sunshine Coast is. Oh, there you go. So beautiful Sunshine Coast in southeast Queensland. So that's around about an hour's north uh, drive north of uh, Brisbane. Um, and we service uh, from Gympie, which is uh, north of the Sunshine Coast, all the way down to southern Brisbane. Um, so it's around about a, a 200 uh, kilometre radius. Um, a, a good footprint and, and a whole heap of work in that area to keep us busy. Um, we've got a team of 35 staff. Um, we're a little different to your modern day um, building company where we uh, train our staff. So all of our staff are on wages. That allows us to train them up specifically for the industry. Um, as I noted, we, are, uh, we only deliver work within that mobility and um, uh, functional space. So we don't do any other type of building work. And the work we deliver does require um, quite a lot of training. So um, not only is it, uh, it require high trade skill, but really a, a good understanding of our clients um, and, and the products that are going to create further function for them as well. So, um, yeah, we've got a, good, uh, a solid team of 35 and uh, well-trained and we really enjoy delivering uh, the, the projects that we, that we work on. Mm. When we last spoke, you said that um, you're talking about five or 600 jobs a month. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct, Ned. Uh, we've got a huge range of modifications that we offer. Um, and on a monthly basis, we're delivering, yeah, five to 600 100 modifications. Um, so they do vary greatly. Um, some, you know, the majority of those mods uh, could be grab rails or handheld showers. Um, and obviously, uh, they extend all the way up to things more, that are more complex, such as vertical lift installation or level access bathrooms um, or environmental controls for m- more clients that need that assistive technology. Mm. But even though you're based in Southeast Queensland, the amount of work and volume you do makes you probably one of the biggest mods builder in Australia, right? Yeah, that's correct, Min. Um, we've been in the industry for just on 10 years now. Uh, we started off in aged care. Uh, and then one, uh, when the NDIS rollout uh, uh, came into fruition, we, thought, we saw that as a, as a great opportunity for our existing skill set. Um, Given the uh, roots that we've got in the industry and and the, and the number of packages and programs that we deliver, um, yeah, we definitely would be uh, one of the one of the larger ones within Australia. That's for sure. I checked. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, website, NDIS website, and I went to Google and Google search one of home modifications. On here it says there's category A, category B, under ten grand. Or category A and category B being ten to twenty grand with regards to people's budgets and everything. Mm-hmm. Can you explain to our listeners what 
those two categories means and what, what examples of those are you looking at? Yeah, so this is a recent uh, change that they've implemented for participants' plans. Um, and it all comes back to sort of that prior approval model. So um, given that uh, no one participant's home or uh, requirements are the same, um, for something that's more complex, there's quite a uh, detailed um, planning and, and system or a process to go through before you had, say, anything that's over that $20,000 mark to be approved. Um, so so they're, they're generally done on a quote-by-quote quote basis. Uh, when you're looking at these Category A and a, ca- a Category B, um, that basically uh, indicates that you've got a participant, um, they've identified that they're going to need uh, modifications that come in under these categories. Um, they've had the funding uh, prior approved, and then you have to find a, a provider such as QSpec to quote them up and making sure that that, that quote aligns with um, the, the budget requirements in the NDIS. And then it just gets prior, it gets approved straight away rather than going through the complex process um, that involves getting uh, two builders and, and occupational therapists involved. Gotcha. But most of your um, patients, oh, sorry, participants, sorry, come to you already pre approved for mods. Is that right? Oh, there's a real mix, mate. Um, so you'll have, we do uh, predominantly the, the, obviously the complex ones, they would have complex mods approved within their plan. Um, so they basically have, it's been identified that they are going to need them. Um, so they'll have uh, some, some funding to get that process started. Um, and then a lot of, a lot of our participants um, do have uh, some capacity building budget uh, approved. So that will allow us to go in there and um, do some more of the minor or the non-structural type modifications. Um, and a lot of, yeah, a lot of participants have that built into the plan for sure. But yeah. <clears throat> our listeners are probably wondering why I've, invited you on board to our podcast to talk about these home mods topics. And I want to just step back a little bit and talk to them and what with you here about why we're talking about this. So as most of our listeners understand, there's, you know, four and a half million people in Australia who are disabled, about 555,000 are in the NDIS scheme, of which about 6% are theoretically or should be on the SDA scheme, SDA funding, which is the um, bricks and mortar side of things. Now, that's 6%. Of the population in the NDIS. The other 94 percent is everyone else. The 94% of the 555,000 people who aren't in SDA are in SIL, SIL um, um, funding um, or whatnot, and they have all sorts of supports and, and, and funding to help them live a better life in some way within the NDIS. Now, why I bring this up is because in the past we talked about as people may realise, a respite accommodation, uh, STA, MTA, STA, which is a, 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 a cousin of SDA, it's a business with really accommodation. And it's important for, for our listeners to understand that, um, yes, SDA is a purposely built brand new home, be it a house or a, a unit. But when it comes to people who cannot be funded for SDA, they will be living in modified homes somewhat. It may be their own home. It could be an institution. Institution, sorry. It may even be a brand new built SDA dwelling that needs modification mm-hmm. as well. Is that correct, Ryan? Yeah, you you spot on there, Min. Um, so there's there's I guess there's two answers to the to the question that you've put forward there. Um, so yeah, ninety four percent of uh, participants are you know living in their own environment, um, and rather than having a, a an SDA house supplied to them. Um, and more often than not, uh, there's there's a few uh, there's a few changes uh, required in the environment to create the function that they're after. Um, so we would work alongside their clinician, so the occupational therapist. Uh, they would go out there and basically complete an assessment. Uh, we'd discuss with them the barriers they're facing. You know, it might be a step to get in the front door or a, a door handle that's hard to grip because they have poor dexterity or something like that. And then we'd design a modification to assist with those barriers. Um, so it would just enable a house that's not being built for function, uh, wasn't designed specifically at an SDA house. Um, that would allow it to allow us to create some further function within that environment. Um, the second answer to your um, to, to your statement or your, or your question there was, um, you know, even a participant that moves into an SDA house, um, quite often we're modifying those homes as well. Um, and the reason being is that an SDA house uh, is designed around the Livable Housing Australia guidelines. So it's a, it's a generic guideline. Um, it's very good. It does create a whole heap of function for the participants, which is fantastic. 
but it doesn't suit their, uh, often doesn't meet their individual needs. Um, so potentially they might have further complexities uh, that will come out and then we'll design those specifics um, just to, to tailor make it to their, um, to their needs, uh, which is really enjoyable to, uh, you know, essentially, you know, put the icing on top of that cake for them and, and make sure it's 110% functional for them. Ryan, can you give us an example, a case study, whereby you may come into a brand new built, fully accessible home? Yeah, the point of thing. What, 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 what kind of changes would you be required to do on the, at the request of the provider and the participant to slightly modify something in that house to make it suitable to their needs? Give, give, give us one or two examples. So the most common example would be uh, ceiling track uh, uh, installation for hoist systems. Um, so that might include you know, uh, installing some ceiling hoists uh, to allow for um, ease of transfer either um, from the bed onto the equipment or into the um, into the the bathroom area. Um, so you know most SDA properties, it is a requirement for them to um, have capacity for a ceiling hoist to install, and quite often we're installing those hoists to suit the client's needs or the, the participant's needs once they move in. Uh, there could be something like if 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 they're lucky enough to have a, a nice pool in the backyard. We could be installing a, a pool hoist, uh, which is something that we do quite often. Um, again, we are in that southeast Queensland area. We've got beautiful weather up here. So it's a great outcome if we can get our um, our participants in the pool and they can do a bit of hydrotherapy work in there. Um, and also we've seen some unique ones as well. Um, some of the robust SDA housing, uh, we've had to uh, bolster them up even further. Um, so they haven't, the, the standard um, is of a high standard and they are quite robust. Um, but in cases we've seen them, they aren't quite robust enough um, for the participants' needs, um, and they've created quite a bit of damage in that environment. Um, so we've gone in there and, um, you know, again, assess the barriers or assess the outcome of that um, participant living in that home, and we've bolstered that house up even further um, to make sure it's safe for them to be living in, the, in there, and also the um, caregivers that are working in that space as well. Can I ask a question? What do you mean by bolster the house up? Further. Well, I guess strengthen strengthen it up is is probably a better word. Um, though, uh, add additional um, uh, wall protection on the walls. Uh, so quite oh, often, so I'm I'm picturing a high impact wall environment around the house. Yeah, there it is. I'm seeing it now in front of me. Yeah, in my head. Are you putting extra layer of material over all the entire wall in the house? That's correct. Yeah, so uh, it's something that we do quite common, uh, commonly is uh, install additional wall protection, um, and that might be uh, due to uh, the participants' uh, use of the equipment. Um, in this case, uh, when it was a, um, it was already a, a, a house that had the um, strengthened walls in it. Uh, we had to add additional layers to it um, because it was a more of a behavioural type situation uh, where the client was. Um, yeah, quite hard on the on the environment. So we had to add add additional strength to those walls by adding um, you know wall protection as another layer. Um, we looked at things like um, ensuring safety for that participant uh, and putting uh, lamination on the inside of glass areas, and also uh, put on uh, sort of safety fixtures on the plumbing fixtures so they couldn't be torn off the off the off the um, off the pipes as well. May I ask you from a technical um, perspective? The high impact wall. What are they most likely made of? And then, what did you put? What, what material did you put on top of that? Yeah, so those uh, the robust housing in SDA already has a um, like a a strengthened wall sheet. So it's not your standard sort of jet ten mil jip uh, rock that you would see in a traditional build. Um, so they've already got a, a robust wall sheet on it. Uh, in addition to that, we we would um, sometimes install, say, um, a finished MDF uh, product, maybe uh, nine to twelve mil thick, um, and we'll finish that off nicely, just so it looks aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, or alternatively, we uh, quite often use a product called Latham Wall Protection, uh, which is around about three or four mil thick um, plastic sheet, and you'll see uh, it's a similar product to what you'd see in care facilities such as you know retirement villages or. Um, hospital type uh, areas where you've got a lot of um, equipment uh, traffic, uh, and it, and it just really saves the walls from you know a, a equipment dotting into the walls and puncturing it. Would would this cost of this extra layer of wall protection you know, come from the participants' funding? 
or not? Ge- yeah, generally it would. Uh, we we don't have a lot to do with that component of it, so we would send and we would go out there with a, with the therapist, and again, we'd we'd assess the either the shortcomings of the SDA environment or or the issues uh, or, or the barriers that are faced by the participant. Um, yep. If it was something uh, like just adjustment of plumbing fixtures um, and and say a smart housing solution or some assistive technology like a hoist, that generally would come out of the participant's plan. Um, if it's something uh, that that was uh, meant to be in the initial build, um, uh, say say for instance a, a solid core door internally, and for some reason it develops and in, in, in installed a hollow core door, then that would be back on the SDA provider. Um, so, but yeah, I, I would say a high percentage, uh, high percentage of the time, it'll be coming out of the participants' plan. Gotcha. Now going back to what I said earlier, the reason why I'm talking about these matters with you. Just to give our, our listeners a better understanding as to what's involved in home puts, obviously, because it's not all about SDA. But more importantly, I mean, as a case study, case example as well, I have a client, a customer, who has three properties in Brisbane, two being two uh, brand new apartments, a three-bed apartment, a two-bed apartment, both fully furnished, and then also a six-bedroom Queenslander house in Murray, um, near East Brisbane. And he wants, and they'll be used for, for Airbnb. And he wants to look at diversifying his portfolio into allowing these properties to be used for short-term accommodation, STA. And that's why I prefer, I'm a burden client to you to look at engaging your company to look at what mods would be required to make these three properties more, more friendly for participants to live in. And this, this, this is, I guess, another, another way of thinking about how can we as investors or property owners provide weddings in the marketplace for for participants to to be used either short term or long term, you know. So this is this is an example of such a uh, engagement. I, I've been talking about this for a while now on our podcast, and this is now an actual case study of how we can implement this to help out with participants for to maybe travelling from interstate or from from regional areas to come to Brisbane to watch a an AFL match or a cricket match and stay short term for three four days, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And and these types of properties are actually really useful um, in the scenario where we're doing complex modifications. Um, quite often, we'll be, uh, you know, ripping an entire bathroom out um, and installing a vertical lift. And a project like that can take anywhere from sort of three to six weeks on site. Um, and if it's a, 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 a dwelling that has a single bathroom, you know, that, that pretty much makes that, uh, that area you know, unlivable for that three to six weeks. So it's great to have this respite option as well that these properties provide. Um, so in this scenario, we, we would sort of pop in there. Um, it's very hard to get an existing house uh, up to an SDA standard. Or um, But if it's a, sh- a short-term um, opportunity or accommodation, uh, a, a temporary um, uh, respite sort of uh, scenario, um, then you can have, you can create a lot of function by doing a lot of small things. Um, yeah, I'd all, I'd recommend your listeners to um, get a, get a really good understanding of the Livable Housing Australia guideline um, and start using that as your as your basis for what you're going to try and create. So it's all about um, trying to have really good circulation uh, in in your common areas and your uh, in your living areas um, and really good access to that home. So yeah, you can certainly do a lot of small adjustments um, to create a really big outcome in in that type of yeah. environment. The great thing with home mods um, is you don't need to comply to building guidelines like the SDA standard requires. Isn't that correct, Ryan? That that's right. So if you're building an SDA, you have very much like uh, a new build um, without the function. Yeah, you, you have a certification process. So if you've got uh, an if you're an SDA provider, um, not only do you have to make sure that house is certified with the Building Code of Australia, but it also has to be certified by a livable housing assessor. Um, to make sure that it aligns with the SDA guidelines. Uh, when we're designing our home modifications, and, and whether it be in an SDA home or just a general dwelling in a residential environment, uh, we're designing that modification to suit the individual needs. Um, so there's no actual standard for that. Uh, it's more of a clinical basis. So it's much like um, going to a GP and, and having something prescribed for you. Um, we're, we're prescribing those modifications for that individual and their environment. Um, so there's there, there's not a generic standard that you would that you would meet. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, next question I have for you is: What assistive technologies do you provide? Yeah, that's a great question, and something that we uh, we do a lot of work on. Um, we're a one stop shop. That's something that we're extremely proud of, um, and we do 
you know, deliver modifications as simple as, you know, small ramps and grab rails, uh, all the way up to vertical lifts and um, level access bathrooms um, and, and a whole range of assistive technology in between. Um, one of the one of the big ones that we do is bidet systems. Um, so something that's quite foreign within Australian culture, um, but really uh, you know well needed out there. Um, if if you have a disability, is um, you know the function to be able to um, have a good clean and and have a high level of hygiene when you're using the toilet area. Um, and it's a great space to be independent in. So uh, we install uh, hundreds of bidets each year. That's a big one for us. Uh, we do door automation. Um, that's another product that um, prior to NDIS just wasn't funded. Um, so we automate a lot of doors and that creates some really good um, security for our participants um, and also um, stops someone that, you know, potentially is quite honourable having to leave their door unlocked for a friend or family member, member to visit or a caregiver to pop in and offer them assistance in the morning. Um, so door automation is a big one. Uh, we do things like stair climbers, um, environmental controls, so you can voice automate your lights or blinds. Mm. Uh, and yeah, we've got a, a huge range of assistive technology. And and again, those voice that we spoke about earlier, um, being the pool in your ceiling voice is another product that we we, we do quite a lot of then um, within that southeast Queensland area. Gotcha. Do you find that the home part of door automation is normally applicable to participants in wheelchairs only, or it could be other scenarios? Uh, as a generalisation, it would be uh, applicable to participants that are using equipment. Um, so yeah, either wheelchairs or you know walking aids. Um, and just because you've you've already got your hands full uh, managing that equipment, um, if you add you know adding uh, access to a door or or a screen as well, um, it just makes it really hard to get in and out of that of that access point. So as a generalisation, I'd say it's a fair statement for sure. Gotcha. Now, what lessons have you learned and the challenges that you have overcome uh, with over the last few years working in the uh, NDR space as a mods builder? Mate, we have got a, a, at QSpec, we've got a huge growth mindset. So we, we love learning. Um, we love taking on challenges and, and we, uh, we, we learn and evolve every single day. So we've We've learned a mountain of a uh, load of information and, and systems and processes. We've adjusted lots of things over the last five or six years. Um, coming from aged care, um, we started doing the DVA contract originally uh, in this mobility space. Um, and it we uh, were a bit naive thinking that that, that skill set would just transfer directly into the disability space. Um, we've gotten really good at um, working with people that have mental health issues uh, because we find that. A high, percentage, a high percentage of our clients do have, um, you know, a mental health component um, as well as a physical disability. Um, so we've, we've got really good at managing that and offering them support rather than, um, you know, it, it, it being um, difficult to deal with. Um, we, we, we try and be understanding and uh, we train our staff in that area as well. Um, so that, that's, that's a big one. Uh, communication is, is a really big one as well. We want to support our clinicians and our clients um, and a high level of communication is really needed in this space. Um, and I think it's probably uh, what some of our competitors don't do very well. Um, we, we offer a fast response um, when, when the modifications do get approved. Sometimes for the complex modifications, it can take years for them to go through the process of approval. Um, so as soon as we get the uh, approval, we get in contact with them and, and talk them through the process and make them feel like they're, they're being looked after. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of learning to do in this space, um, and I think if anyone is looking to get into it, um, yeah, really come into it with that open mindset and and, and try and understand your, your participants and what they need and um, you know potentially what they're going through, so you can offer the best outcome for them. I think um, what you said there, looking to get into it, I think it's uh, an understatement. Uh-huh. Um, as investors who are looking to create product, SDA product in Australia. Um, you should always have the mindset that you know that your house is generic and it's only in its own delivery. It's not the perfect gig. It's not the perfect house uh, because there's going to be a attrition of participants over many years ahead. And you always have to be open minded enough to actually know that you have to spend money for modifications to suit the income participant who has a special need that needs to be resolved from some, from some modification by by a, by a company like yours. Isn't that correct? You always have to be open minded. Yeah, that's right, and I and I think you probably want to look at it uh, as also a, a great value add that you can that you can offer as a provider. Um, mm-hmm. We get tremendous joy seeing the function that that our modifications create for the participants, and 
um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our clients are just extremely loyal to us, whether it be in that NDIS or aged care space. They're so grateful for those modifications or those adjustments, um, and you'll see them. They uh, and if you're looking at it as a as a business perspective, um, they're very loyal, and they'll they'll be you know potentially a really long term tenant to you because you've gone over and above and created that function for them in the, in that space. So if you're creating um, you know an ease of living for them, that goes a long way, and and then you're going to have a long term tenant. So. A, a, even though it might be a, a bit of an outlay initially, um, you you get a, a long term return on that. So I, I think um, really trying to create that good service, uh, which is the mindset you should have in any business, really, or any investment, um, create a good outcome for your for your participant, and you'll you'll go you'll go a long way. Gotcha. So right now, our staff met your your um, booth at the Brisbane Disability Expo a few months ago, and you, you're obviously there at showcasing your services. Over the last few years, how, how have people come to know your organisation? Is it because of referrals from OTs and physiotherapists? Or is it advertising, going to expos? How, did, how, did, how does the QSpec brand get its um, brand awareness out there in the past few years? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And we've, and we've, we've grown rapidly um, over the last five years in particular. Um, there's a, there's a number of answers to that question. Um, so word of mouth is a really big one um, because we were existing experts in this field um, and we were able to support clinicians and and the participants uh, as the scheme rolled out. So we were sort of we we hit the ground the NDIS ground running. Um, so we we're able to offer that support instantly rather than try and understand and learn about the industry. So that was a real advantage. Um, we also offer um, professional development ses- uh, sessions. So we educate people within the industry about home modifications and the clinical uh, considerations when prescribing them. Um, we really are the experts in this field, um, and we want to share that expertise. Uh, we, work, we work with uh, uh, University of Queensland and also the Sunshine Coast University and educate all their students. Um, so education is a really big um, part of our advertisement. Um, and it, and it, uh, it's, it's great because essentially it enables them to prescribe better home mods for participants and also, um, you know, creates more modifications for us as a, as a service provider as well. Uh, we, we attend expos. Um, as you, as you mentioned, we met, we met, uh, some of your team at the expos. They're a great way to get out there and meet people within the industry. Um, and they're just the, just the general marketing with the, uh, the online platforms such as, uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, and we do a monthly newsletter. So if anyone would like to hear more about QSpec building mobility solutions and what we do, um, pick us an email and uh, we'll put you onto our newsletter because we do a monthly newsletter and talk about you know what we're doing within the industry and we're we're always up to something pretty fun, pretty fun. Wonderful. So let's wrap up things up. Any final words of advice you have to any clinicians around Australia, other other participants who are going thinking about you know um, making changes to their home, or even investors who've just built a brand new house? Any words of advice from you as a home mods builder to anyone listening um, how, how to better improve the environment or an environment for someone who's a participant um, to, to maximize their lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. So for anyone that's looking to getting into the uh, home, mate, uh, home mod space, whether that be uh, updating your own home or as a clinician to um, you know design a good modification for one of your participants or clients that you're working with, um, find a good uh, home mods provider. If you're in South East Queensland, come and see us at QSpec. Um, but find a good home mods provider that wants to have that collaborative approach. Um, I think we're working in this, this, this great space of, uh, of community health where we can, we can talk about the barriers, um, and then, and work through them as a, as a client or a participant, uh, as a clinician and as a home mods provider. And it's that real, uh, team collaborative approach that delivers a, a good outcome. Um, because you want your, you want the participant to be really proud of their home modification. Um, and, and, and that creates, uh, a lot more function in it as well. Uh, if they're proud of that modification, how it looks, function to create, and they've been a part of creating that modification with mine, that's, um, you know, that goes a long way. So try and find a, a home, a home mods provider that, that really wants to create a good outcome and work with you. But Jack, is your showroom in Murchie or is it a large, large location, a large room? Uh, the, it's, it's more of a training trial space. So we've set that up for participants to come in and trial. We've got functional trials uh, areas. So we've got a, a traverse ceiling hoist so you can come in and, and trial that. Um, it's, we've got bidet systems and all the, all the bidet uh, systems that we've got on display. We've got a, an environmental controls wall 
So we've got our door automation and blinds and, and some assistive technology set up and a stair climber. Um, we're setting up a walk-in bath in the next month. Um, so it's a really good space for participants to come in and check out all our, you know, grab rails and fixtures and that type of thing. Um, but also for us to run through, you know, different op- options they have. And uh, we find a lot of clinicians come in and when they're putting in their submissions to the NDIS, um, you know, quite often we're setting up uh, the, the ceiling hoist uh, to, to demonstrate that that transfer, um, if the ceiling hoist installed, you know, potentially could reduce the care needs uh, of that participant as well, uh, which is what the NDIS like to see. So uh, if they film that within our uh, functional uh, showroom, um, that's a that goes a long way when they're submitting it uh, for funding to the NDIS. So um, yeah, it's 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 not necessarily just a showroom. Um, it's around about uh, eighty square meters, uh, and that's uh, attached to our our, um, our custom fabrication workshop, which is around about three to four hundred square meters, uh, where we fabricate all those custom components. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for your time. Um, how do people find out more about? You guys, what's your website? What's your phone number? What's the best way to contact your your office? Great, yeah. So the, the best way to get in contact with us is either through the website or via email. Um, the website is www.qspet.com.au. Uh, that, and that's that's Q S P E C, right? That's correct, mate. Q S P E C dot com dot au. Um, so jump on the website and uh, there's a contact uh, drop down there. Um, jump on the socials, so Facebook and Instagram. Um, they're updated weekly with with some jobs, and feel free to flick us through a DM. Um, and yeah, like I said, if you wanted to jump onto our mailing list, we're always updating our um, our clients with what we're up to. So um, we try and try and get it out there as much as we can. Wonderful, Ryan. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it, mate. Uh, have a have a have a great uh, day. Done. Bye bye, mate. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.